go to Alicia Fagan. Alicia has a little twist, not only to her NDE, but what she does, and I think that's important. So please, welcome Alicia Fagan. I've been called twisted before, but not with that much of a compliment, I think. Um, I'm a therapist, um, a clinical psychotherapist, and a drug and alcohol counselor. And what I decided to do today was both talk about NDEs in general, thank you, um, and my own specifically. Um, my NDE was 19 years ago, um, and it was when my kids were small. But when I looked up NDEs on the internet, it was certainly different from what I'd experienced. Everyone seems to have a different group of characteristics in their own near-death experience. But it's defined as a profound psychological event that may occur to a person close to death, or if not near death, a situation of profound physical or emotional crisis. And it includes transcendental and mystical elements. So you don't have to be close to death, although I was and many people are. Sometimes it's an emotional, um, feeling of crisis. Sometimes a friend of mine had one where she was in two places at once. She saw herself at her mother's in Massachusetts and in Connecticut. Um, and she went through the tunnel and some of the other characteristics that people have talked about. Um, whether it's emotional or physical, they seem to have the same after effects, which I'll talk about. And they contain the same images of love and peace, because that's what people feel in their hearts after having gone through it. Um, the characteristics of a near-death experience were talked about by Raymond Moody in 1975 in his book, Life After Life. And they include a replay of events of your life, um, out of body experience may occur, a brilliant warm light, moving through a dark tunnel towards the light, being greeted by friends or family who welcome you but there's usually a wall or a bridge or a line between you and them, and they tell you it's not your time. Sometimes you're given a choice. Typically you're told by the beings on the other side it's not your time. And there's typically some communication with the people on the other side. One interesting piece of information that I didn't know until I started running the NDE group in Farmington, Connecticut, was that people who are familiar with near-death experiences before they have one usually don't have the characteristics of them. And Bruce Grayson, who used to run the group there and who was in on the ground floor of the near-death experience group, said that he thought it was because people who knew about NDEs didn't need to have one, that they had the pieces of information they needed to get on the path they needed to be on. My own NDE was sort of a two-part experience. I had gotten sick on a Sunday. On Monday, I had the flu. On Tuesday and Wednesday, I came down with bilateral pneumonia. And on Thursday, I was on a high-tech ventilator. And the doctor I was in practice with told my friends and family to come and see me because I wouldn't last out the night. 
The first part of the near-death experience for me was seeing myself on the shore of a beach and looking out over the waters and seeing a hooded figure that I knew was the essence of evil. And I was terrified because I knew somehow that it was my role to protect people from that evil. But I also knew I was weak from being sick. And I put my arms out and the next thing I knew, I had let go of the control that I thought I might have. And that's typical for people who have a near-death experience that's negative. Um, if they let go of control of it, it turns into a pleasurable or positive experience. Um, when I went beyond that, I remember going through a tunnel, hearing a humming noise, seeing a pinpoint of light at the end of the tunnel, and knowing that other bodies were accompanying mine and I was looking toward the light, wanting to go toward it, and suddenly I heard a voice, alas, it was male, um, say, you can't die now. Your children are too young to lose you. My kids were four and five at the time. And typically, research has found that the only people that voluntarily come back from a near-death experience are mothers of young children. And so I prayed to everyone I could think of to let me come back. And the next thing I knew, I was back in my body. After that time, a friend of mine who was a hypnotherapist said to me, you had another NDE, you just don't remember it. and he wanted to put me under hypnotherapy. Let go of control, not my idea of fun. But I agreed to do it, and what I saw was myself on the ceiling of the room, of, as other people have mentioned, looking down at my body in fetal position. And I had been in ICU for eight days. Um, they didn't think I was gonna live, I was on life support. Um, but I came out of the hypnotherapy sobbing and my friend said to me, why are you crying? And although this had nothing to do with the NDE as I had remembered it, I said, because I've always wondered, I'm also, I also was raised Catholic, weren't we all? Um, I remember saying, why did Mary choose to lose her son, to sign up for the pain she went through? Did she know about it in advance? And when I was driving home, I heard a voice say to me, he needed me and I was the only one who could do it. Um, Yes, it certainly answered my question. I've had other visions since then, um, which is not uncommon for people who've been through NDEs. Um, characteristics of psychological change include, as people have said, not being afraid of death anymore. People who've gone through an NDE typically aren't afraid of death. People who've tried to kill themselves almost never try to hurt themselves again because they know they've come back with a mission. Um, experiencers develop a feeling of timelessness um, except for before and after. There's before the NDE and after the experience. Um, many experiencers become more intuitive. They remember the future. They finish other people's sentences. Um, sometimes they can hear, or they feel they can hear, plants or animals speak.
Forgiveness tends to replace criticism. I think you had mentioned, whoops, where'd she go? Um, Barbara had said that she had felt forgiveness toward the people that had abused her. People forgive others. And people who've had a sense of materialism or high sense of achievement often give that over. They're much more laid back after they go through an NDE. Unfortunately for family members and spouses, that's often a real tough thing to go through. It wasn't what they signed up for. So the divorce rate is very high for people who've been through an NDE. It's about 75%. Um, the physiological changes um, that people go through in, after an NDE include heightened intelligence. I think, of course, I was intelligent before it. <laughs> but <laughs> they also become more creative and inventive. Uh, they have unusual sensitivity to light and sound. I remember when I came out of the NDE, everything was super bright. Sound was terribly loud. Smell was really excruciating. Couldn't tolerate loud smells, if you will. Um, there's an electrical sensitivity that goes on. Um, increased allergies. Um, one of the things the internet said was, we're physically younger looking. <laughs> Would you believe I'm 90? No. <laughs> um, many can no longer tolerate hard rock music. Okay, maybe that was before. Um, energy surges up and down the body. And some researchers feel that that's kundalini energy um, that is tipped off, cued by the NDE. Um, and their electrical sensitivity also tends to stop watches, crash computers, um, change TV channels, make microphones squeal, light bulbs pop. I don't know if any of you have had those experiences yet. Um, it's a bit bizarre, interesting. I find that when I am particularly upset, either happy or angry, and I'm driving down the street at night, street lights will go on and off around me. Um, it's kind of weird. Um, people also have changed um, feelings about their finances, um, about relationships, about healing. Um, in general, their attitude is much more one of peace and calmness than it was before. I guess that's about it. 